Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Reprieve Media CIC's coverage of International Women's Day. What we've got coming up for you now is some of our source content. We tried to tailor our source content around International Women's Day. So what we did is we had a little look round to see what we can find. And we came up with this. It's an hour long stage talk really. From a website called estherwindsor.com. And it's a chat called Motherhood, Power and Love. The chat is curated and chaired by Esther Windsor on Resonance FM, where the show was called Enemies of Good Art. Just a bit now about the show and the uh, people involved. Esther Windsor is a curator, artist and mother, completing a practice-based PhD in Fine Arts at Kingston University. Anuchka Gross is a Lacanian psychoanalyst member of the Centre for Freudian Analysis and Research. She is also a mother and author of No More Silly Love Songs, A Realist's Guide to Romance. Mo Thorpe is a course director of fine art at Chelsea, convener of the Subjectivities and Feminisms Research Group, Chelsea School of Art, an artist, mother and grandmother. And finally, Dr Lisa Baraitsa is a feminist writer, a psychotherapist and senior lecturer in psychosocial studies at Birkbeck. She is the author of Maternal Encounters, The Ethics of Interruption. This programme is called Enemies of Good Art and it's on the 100th anniversary of Women's Day. Enemies of Good Art was initiated by Martina Mullaney and Anna Shorter and seeks to investigate the possibilities of combining art practice and family commitments. In particular, it seeks to encourage participation by parents and their children in a series of public discussions and art-based events. In his 1938 novel, Enemies of Promise, Cyril Connolly asserted that there is no more sombre enemy of good art than Pram in the Hall. Since April 2009, Enemies of Good Art has debated the issues arising from this infamous quote. So we hope you enjoy it. Don't forget to check out the website, estherwindsor.com. So without further ado, coming up next, we have Motherhood, Power and Love, curated and chaired by Esther Windsor, courtesy of Resonance FM. And... The show is called Enemies of Good Art. Thank you very much for listening and all the best. Hello and welcome to Enemies of Good Art on the 100th anniversary of Women's Day. I'm Esther Windsor and I'll be introducing and chairing today's talk. Enemies of Good Art was initiated in 2009 by Martina Maloney and Anna Shorter. It seeks to investigate the possibilities of combining art practice and family commitments. In particular, it seeks to encourage participation by parents and their children in a series of public discussions and art-based events. In his 1938 novel, Enemies of Promise, Cyril Connolly asserted, there is no more sombre enemy of good art than the pram in the hall. Since April 2009, Enemies of Good Art has debated the issues arising from this infamous quote. They have also brought together communities of women across a spectrum in contemporary art practices that recognise the diversity of choices and experience motherhood presents to women. Enemies of Good Art holds weekly discussion programmes on Resonance Fridays at 4 o'clock. To mark the 100th anniversary of Women's Day, Martin, Tina Maloney has invited women in art and media practices to contribute programmes throughout the day for Resonance FM. This is the first programme entitled Motherhood, Power and Love. From Yummy Mummy, Slummy Mummy, Super Nummy, Nanny to Pram Face, aspiration and anxiety and instruction mixed to produce potent symbols in popular culture and at the heart of political discourse and emotional life. This talk examines contemporary motherhood and questions romance, marriage, mortgage, motherhood, why not having it all might not be a bad thing. What is the value of motherhood? What's love got to do with it? And what is emotional capital? So in the studio with me to talk about this is Dr. Lisa Baritza, a feminist writer, a psychotherapist and senior lecturer 
in psychosocial studies at Birkbeck. She is author, author of Maternal Encounters, The Ethics of Interruption, and founder of MAMSI, an interdisciplinary research network, and also a, an e-journal, Mapping, the, uh, Mapping Maternal... Uh, sorry, MAMSI stands for Mapping Maternal Subjectivities and Ethics, and she's also founded an e-journal, Studies in the Maternal. Also, we have Anita Gross, who's a practicing Lacanian psychoanalyst and member of the Center for Freudian Analysis and Research, where she lectures. She's a mother and author of No More Silly Love Songs, A Realist Guide to Romance. And also Mo Fropp, who's course director of fine art at Chelsea and convener of the Subjectivities and Feminisms Research Group at Chelsea School of Art. She is an artist, mother and grandmother. Hello, everyone. Hello. 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 <laughs> Um, so I'd just like to open this talk by talking about how I came to thinking about maternal identity in this particular guise. Um, I was part of Riot Girl in the um, so-called third wave feminism, um, where, amongst other things, we tried to reclaim words like bitch, cunt, whore, and embrace the kind of post-punk DIY aesthetic. Um, and I came to thinking about the moment of now in looking at Angela Roby's book, um, in the aftermath of feminism, where she talks about symbolic violence seen in um, reality TV genres like underage and pregnant, what not to wear, and super nanny, that have also been very well written about by Imogen Tyler and Tracy Jensen. Um, motherhood is a unique moment in women's lives and in feminism, and for women, many women, including myself, the things that we may have taken for granted in feminism become up for question on becoming mothers. Mothers are a hot topic and have been fully coded and commodified, spat out and served up on a platter, depending on which kind of one you are. Um, so I'd just like to read a quote about um, Chav Mums, a kind of character of, of Vicky Pollard, before we move on to ask our speakers about what they think about this topic. The reason Vicky Pollard caught the public imagination is that she embodies with such fearful accuracy some of the greatest scourges of contemporary Britain, aggressive all-female gangs of embittered hormonal drunken teenagers, gym slip mums who choose to get pregnant as a career option, pasty faced lardy gutted, slappers who'll drop their knickers in the blink of an eye. These people do exist and every bit as ripe and just as much a target for social satire as were, say, the rattled working class drunks set up by Hogarth in Gin Lane. This is a quote from James Jellingpool, um, not me. <laughs> um, so, Lisa, if we could um, start with you. Um, I know we've talked about the idea that idealis idealization and denigration in femininity, and particularly in maternal identity, is a kind of stable feature of, of, um, of thinking about um, mothers and women. What can you help us with here, thinking about these extremes of the depictions of, of mothers? Well, I guess I want to start just by saying how nice it is to be here and talking about motherhood on International Women's Day. And I think just that in and of itself is an interesting thing, because I think we come in and out of being able to think about and acknowledge the maternal, not just in culture, but also within feminism. And so I'm very pleased in a way that the opening sort of talk on, on, on this day on resonance is, is in part about mothers and motherhood. And I think that immediately sort of situates us in a very complex and difficult set of discussions. What you've begun to highlight is the relationship between what might, we might think of as a kind of age-old need to both idealise and denigrate the maternal, a kind of splitting as a way to deal with the intense and complicated emotional sort of responses we have to the maternal generally and perhaps to the mothers of our early psychic life. But you've also immediately brought up how all... Uh, all of these figures are mediated and so we never come to those split idealizations other than through sort of cultural representations so and, and those representations are classed and raced and and they occupy a particular moment in a in the history of a culture um, which needs to be examined and unpicked all the time so I guess we're talking about if you like psychic and social sort of interactions here I think one of the the problems with the sort of more psychoanalytic thinking around the splitting, if you like, of, of 
uh, the maternal into these very extreme forms which can then be, as you say, spat out or engaged with in a sort of idealised way, is it kind of reduces the maternal always to a figure in an infant's psychic life. And I think what I've been very concerned to do is to reinstate the mother as a mother, <laughs> if you like, as, as, as a figure and also an embodied and lived experience that is a part of women's lives that comes to us anew. It's not simply the reworking of our early idealised and denigrated relations with maternal imagos. It's also um, a, a, new, a new phase in a mother's life, but particularly a new subjective position. And I think there, there's a lot of a big challenge in really taking that on board and understanding um, what that transition is and what it is that children, if you like, a gift back to women as the opening of a new subjective experience. And I think you've begun to touch on that by, by talking about the sort of um, enormous change that happened for you personally, that, um, but also for feminism, that we, that we are in a way prompted or forced into rethinking um, many of the basic tenets by which we've lived our lives as women at that mm -hmm. moment that we become, we become mothers. I can go on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, well, I think it's very hard, isn't it, when you become a mother to um, to kind of navigate that terrain. I think these the reason these some of these stereotypes are so compelling is that we do enter into a place of uncertainty, and you're thinking, "Am I a yummy mummy or a slummy mummy? Perhaps I'm chav mum." Or it's and these things are very powerful. We're quite kind of suggestive. There's the need for. Um, perhaps, you know, advice or identification with particular things. Um, and I wonder how we can think about um, being able to make space to think about being a mother and articulate that that isn't necessarily caught up in um, a, a particular social moment, um, of, um, especially as perhaps, you know, older or, or, or middle class mothers with a professional background, are we... You know, are they just yummy mummies? <laughs> Is there, or how else can we think about this? Um, Anita, would, would you? Um, an, yeah, an I was Sorry. thinking about this thing of exactly of identification and and looking for good identifications if possible, because it seems that the thing that happens when you become a mother is that it's a you know a kind of bomb explodes in your own life mm -hmm. and you have to deal with that, but also you become something different for other people because you're a mother and you're seen to be a mother, so you have a different identity for you know beyond you people are projecting things onto you at the same time as your experience completely explodes and so from the inside and the outside it's a very very difficult thing to put together suddenly and I just I remembered when you were speaking that I had a baby at the same time as Madonna and I was lying in bed in a total kind of sweaty mess with vomit everywhere watching Top of the Pops and, and there she was you know three months later <laughs> absolutely you know with a flat stomach performing perfectly and it is that you're looking for things Things, but I, I don't know which things are the most useful or the most helpful. I mean, whether that's persecutory or, or inspirational. <laughs> yes. Um, Mo, you've had um, um, experience of, um, of second wave and third wave feminism mm -hmm. and are, are kind of engaged um, with as being a mother and a, a grandmother and in teaching um, you know, presumably young, young women in um, Chelsea. What do you think about this? Well, apart from my own experience, of course, and I agree with the speakers before about sort of the shock the, of motherhood being propelled into another space, um, during that period when I had, I've had three children um, fairly young, and um, I didn't actually uh, work. Um, I didn't actually have this career that I have now. I was an artist. And so I didn't have sort of a career interruption in that way. I continued to make my own work. But interestingly, you mentioned my teaching um, and my own insistence, in a way, in my own uh, identification as a feminist uh, and my own beliefs in, in uh, the experience of women um, and how that, certainly with an art school situation, which is actually very male-driven, um, the art school, uh, and this issue of feminism really was no-go territory. Um, and even though I did actually quite a lot of teaching around issues of women and feminism and um, artist practice, practice by women, um, 
that actually became, in a way, quite difficult um, to raise an, as with younger students. Um, it's changed more recently. Mm. I think there is an opening up to um, questioning and looking at this um, idea of being a mother, what it is to be a woman and to exist in the art world, uh, to, to think of feminism um, and the history of feminism um, as really uh, no-go territory. Um, and it's only recently that it's being welcomed again, uh, that we can talk together as students about sexuality, through directly through sexuality, um, and explorations of sexuality as opening up incredible territory. Um, and I find that stu young students are really very much eager now to know from my generation mm. this history, which is fantastic, uh, uh, I mean, for me personally, as well as to share this with, uh, with younger artists, with, with students. Um, yes, I'm kind of reminded of my own teaching, where I'm teaching um, sex and visual culture and cultural studies, where I'd be told um, it's not relevant to us, it's done, you know, it doesn't kind of matter anymore. We're all equal anyway now, aren't we? Um, and I'm reminded of um, something that Angela McRoby talks about in her book, about the process of disarticulation, that by women's increasing participation in the labour market, um, they... Um, imagine that by having, and having a child, and this is certainly something that I've kind of had fed back to me that is important kind of not to make that a primary concern, to not talk about it, to try and kind of, you know, disguise and downplay your pregnancy and your breastfeeding and your having to be back for the child minder and to make sure you always talk about your work and not kind of bring this issue kind of um, into, um, onto the table and, you know, into kind of potential embarrassment. Um, and also, I was remembering you told me that you, this history is something that you're you're kind of documenting as a resource in your in the feminisms and subjectivities research group through the women's art library. Oh right, yes, my own experience of the women's art library, which I I'm not quite sure when it began. I should have done my homework then, but it's certainly been for the last probably 40 years. Um, um, the history of the Women's Art Library, which was initially a magazine. Um, artists, women artists, mothers, all these issues came up then. And then as the, the Women's Artists Slide Library, which was where um, artworks by women, women actually gave in to the library a certain amount of slides to document their own work. And that was an amazing resor resource. Um, and very, very much needed by women to, certainly my generation, to identify with each other um, this unspoken um, uh, experience of not only being a woman but being a mother as well. Um, and particularly it was important to me this, this um, identification of other artists who were women and actually being in the shock of being a mother in this territory which was neutral of being an artist um, and and so that that resource the the women's art library became later to be known um, was an incredible <clears throat> place of meeting of of and later with the magazine make magazine particularly um, has got fantastic history and yes I'm at the moment with my colleague Dr Marie Walsh from Chelsea we are going to start looking at this archive and we have a publisher so we're going to hopefully that's going to be something we think it's the right moment now to dive into this archive and and uh, bring up all this incredible history um, going back at least for you know mm. 40 years actually more so you think there is a moment for re-articulation of feminism? Yes, it is now. It is now. I'm really mm. finding that extraordinary. Maybe in a bigger way as well about, you know, the significance of protest in the, in the late 60s. Um, and, and I'm finding that something quite extraordinary personally as well, somebody my age who, who was young at that time and was part of that movement, um, and how that's almost in a way replaying itself. So that's... Mm. Uh, 
I, I think something is happening at the moment, and certainly with my experience of which having to keep quiet for quite a lot of mm. years, certainly within the art school situation about my experience as a woman and and a mother and sexuality have been, you know, sort of, as you say, um, I remember people saying as well that uh, with the work that they did as a student, as an art student, what, what you know, you got a feminist second for your degree. You know, you were seen as the, <laughs> that's the way the place you were put. <laughs> Can I ask, do, do your male students show as much interest in the discussion of sexuality as female students, or is it still a kind of women's topic? Yeah, I think it's mostly a woman's topic. Mm -hmm. There are um, quite a few guys who are interested in sexuality mm -hmm. and their own personal mm -hmm. sexuality, but issues of masculinity, which have always trailed on, I think, behind this, mm -hmm. are, have been very interesting and addressed. But um, I think there is a certain amount of respect at least now, mm -hmm. for these issues mm -hmm. being aired. And it, it isn't sort of eyes roll to the ceiling yeah. anymore. I think it is seriously, um, ha ha has uh, taken as a serious issue at the moment. Mm -hmm. It was a great relief for me to um, see the word subjectivities and, and feminisms within, as a research group, as a kind of written down, stated official intention. Um, but, um, yes, not Chelsea. that we didn't have a lot of anxiety about sure. the inclusion of feminisms in oh. the title. It certainly was what we stuck to it, and it does cause between the members a certain amount of anxiety about, you know, what it might stand for, even the bit of a, you know, oh God, here they are again, or whatever. So, but it is empowering, and it is insisting on keeping that... Uh, identification as feminism's s with an mm. in its plurality its pl plural histories of feminists of feminisms mm. can i just uh, ask how do, how do you make sense then of what you're describing as a kind of shift or resurgence if you like in the classroom so in some ways amongst younger women to want to talk about sexuality you're saying motherhood and feminism and the sort of ongoing resistance, in a way, the fact that you needed to stop and reconsider in your group whether even putting the word feminisms up on the website was okay or not. There's a sort, there's a sort of tension there. Yes, um, there is. Um, motherhood, you know, it, motherhood, I think, is another extension of that. But certainly, sexuality and the expression of sexuality, and how uh, we started here today with Esther talking about this. Um, um, so-called, she didn't mention liberated uh, uh, young women, certainly approach to sexuality um, and the troubling aspects of that um, and certainly thinking of Natasha Walters' recent book about, and in a way almost like her horror of uh, this is the uh, the current resurgence of or the legacy of feminism, is this what this kind of chaff culture or um, young women's excessive display of sexuality um, in relation to the history of feminism. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question there, Lisa. Or um, mm -hmm. yes, I think you're pointing towards the ongoing anxiety, really, around women's sexuality. And and I I think what I notice is that actually the maternal still retains a kind of mute aspect to it you know we're talking about what can what, what's now possible to speak about again in the classroom and I think what I hear you saying is we can speak about sexuality but still through those mediated forms which means we we, we again have to readdress the kind of split denigration idealization uh, idealization aspects of the feminine but also there's still something that keeps getting sidelined and I wonder in a way what the maternal then holds as, as part of that sidelined or, or mute aspect of femininity that, that doesn't get spoken about. Because actually my experience with teaching is that um, there is a, a return to being able to speak about feminism and feminisms, but actually it's much more difficult to talk about the maternal. That to yeah. run a course on motherhood is actually really quite unusual still Absolutely. in the academy in the UK. Yeah, yeah. That is something a bit beyond in a way, but don't forget the well certainly in my case teaching undergraduate students that there is a limited experience of that. They think of their mothers. I mean my identification as a mother which I might sort of 
keep quiet or not raise, but um, certainly in in relation to teaching, um, theorizing these issues actually is very, I see it, absolutely liberating for young women to actually find a way of articulating these ideas, how they might think about it, about empowering women, you know, particularly, you know, think of just Judith Butler and power relations, getting them to reflect on their own personal experience. And, of course, of artists, as I mentioned uh, early on, this so-called neutral territory, uh, certainly of my generation, of what being an artist is and personal experience being sidelined there, certainly by women. Um, so for, I think, in aspects of teaching, which is so fantastic. Um, and as I said, I'm finding that there's a generation of young students now who do want to listen, who do want to engage with this. And having, you know, the opportunity is not just about sharing experiencing experiences, but actually to have help with theorizing. Um, there's actually, you know, students... Uh, mouths drop open from their own experience that they can actually begin to articulate these ideas of personal experience which may be excruciating about their own sexuality and their own problems um, but to find a place where they can discuss it um, and reflect on their own experience and how that might enable them of course I'm dealing with the world of the artwork so how the artwork might uh, as you know, as cultural um, uh, uh, product or uh, um, language, their own language uh, is can become actually very liberating. And I'm thinking as well that uh, uh, reminiscing in a way on my own realization of that when I uh, started having children and an attempt to keep going as an artist and. Um, uh, uh, encountering Mary Kelly's work post Barton document in the probably mid 70s and I actually was with a pushchair and when I came across the and I remember being incredibly stunned by this not this picture you know a portrait of a woman with her baby that endless gushy um, uh, romantic uh, approach of the, the mother and child, the image of the mother and child, the experience of the mother and child, even by, by women artists, earlier women artists. But here was something that was um, really um, articulated through theory, through Lacanian theory about the relationship but of her own experience as a mother for, with taking her, the experience of, uh, of uh, educating her her son, I think, during the first six years of his life. And this was this incredible, articulate, powerful piece of work which included Lacanian text and dirty nappies. And I remember it being incredibly empowering to myself, thinking, my God, this is might be a way to do it. Um, uh, because it's, you know, it's, it's always, I think, as you said at the beginning, Esther, it's always, it is a shock this space of being a mother uh, 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 mm. one's own sexuality is something else but the, 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 the shock of being a mother this being propelled into another world which totally uh, takes you over how might it be possible to keep um, a space in the world where this may be um, have some kind of uh, uh, cultural clout and certainly I think Mary Kelly's postpartum document and I think maybe that's being looked at again, it's certainly Yes, still it's something that there was a, a programme on Enemies of Good Art about, about you know, <laughs> let's not talk about Mary Kelly but we always come back to kind of talking about that but it's important and it's important as well because of thinking about objection and I'm wondering that in women talking about um, or making work perhaps about motherhood or the maternal experience, which is very abject, would this be um, an essentialist um, notion? Um, and I would just to come back to again this like McRaby thing. She talks about um, a kind of, of um, gender melancholia that women suffer through their disarticulation from feminism, and that they suffer. She uses Butler's um, analysis of illegible rage. Um, and she uses an example of 
um, Amy Winehouse, she said, for example, when the miniskirt clad phallic girl Amy Winehouse, she's looking at you, is free to fight, puke and have casual sex like a guy. Underneath this pretense of gender equality lies what she calls a provocation to feminism, a triumphant gesture um, on the part of a resurgent patriarchy. So if young women who occupy this kind of abject kind of space, how do they articulate um, their experience of objection or feeling abject or being um, projected onto as abject as young mothers? Um, and Anushka, I know we were talking a little bit about that and about kind of what, um, what motherhood might mean. Can you yeah. help us with that? I, I don't know if I can, <laughs> but, but um, we were certainly thinking about the, the fact that as a mother, you're suddenly in contact with all the things that have been pushed out of life. So you're in contact with shit, with, with vomit, with bodies, with, with also the, the, the baby's body, this sort of out of control, um, you know, thrashing thing and the thing that can't speak the thing that can't you know articulate what it wants all all those things that are, are sort of shameful and terrible in adult life the things that you have to get away from from not being able to control yourself from not being able to say things from you know i don't know losing control of your bodily functions all that stuff is the stuff that you deal with in on a daily basis as a mother and so to be around it and in contact with it is is to be in a really kind of particular position because you're suddenly in touch with everything that's usually erased and so it's shocking for you but I think it, that's one of the things that's shocking for other people you're sort of you've gone over to the dark side for a while <laughs> does that explain some of the ambivalence that um, women experience from um, other people and other mothers from the way they kind of take up space with their buggy from the mess they produce from their kind of demands from their tearfulness from their all the things that kind of get kind of loaded and lumped you know onto mothers Yes, exactly. Yeah, because I suppose in in a way babies are properly disgusting, and and mm. mothers are dealing with that. And so when they all descend on a cafe, then it is something horrific. And and as a mother dealing with that, you might feel very upset that that people experience you in that way. But but of course they will because you're dealing with the stuff that's not meant to be seen. And you know part of growing up is learning to to hide your shit and to to speak and to contain yourself, contain your rage, not to cry, you know, do all those things. Babies are doing all of it in public. And mothers and mothering in public. Yes, and I yeah, think yes, exactly. What's yes. so sort of in your face yeah. is that, you know, the, the mother is the person who is supposed to help the baby to, to do all of those things. Yeah, exactly. And so what kind of subject position is that, mm. that maternal subject position? Who is, she is she who is there to aid the development of the, mm. the child but in herself is kind of still emptied out yes. so she's left with the leftovers of mm. that experience the kind of the shit yeah. if you like but she's not really accorded a valuable function mm. in and of herself mm, mm, mm. as the person who really must do that work and then sort of fade away yeah, oh, yeah. That so that we can me. come into subjectivity yeah. as, mm, as mm, individuals mm. yes yeah, totally thank and you that's so, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Lisa, would you read that brilliant quote from your book about <laughs> which um, on page four? I think it is about being about being left. Oh, from Anna Furman. Yes. How much of the quote do you want? You just um, want that? Just a bit before about um, where you talk about the um, abjection and place of the mother. Uh, okay, as much it's as kind as of well-charted ground, so yes. it's not new, but here we go. Caught in an ever-widening gap between her idealisation and denigration in contemporary culture and her indeterminate position as part object, part subject within the Western philosophical tradition, the mother has always been left hopelessly uncertain with all the death-like and dreadful connotations that the abject possesses. In some senses, she is everywhere, our culture saturated with her image in its various guises. And yet, theoretically, she remains a shadowy figure who seems to disappear from the many discourses that explicitly try to account for her. Perhaps this is unsurprising, given that we are all, as infants, we might have needed to conjure up an ever-present fantasy mother whom we are told must find just the right balance of presence without impingement, if we follow Winnicott, and who needs, therefore, to remain partly in the shadows and then gradually, but appropriately, fail again Winnicott and finally sort of fade away. As the psychoanalyst Erna Furman put it, motherhood is a lifelong process of being there to be left. <laughs> well, that's what you were talking about. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, and so, how? 
can we value motherhood? What's the value of motherhood? Um, can we have something like emotional capital that has been kind of talked about um, uh, in terms of the investment that mothers make in their children, much like we might have kind of social capital or kind of economic capital. I know that you write um, a lot about uh, the kind of ethics of motherhood. Um, can we talk a bit about val the value of motherhood? I suppose two responses to that. Um, one about ethics and one about, I suppose, rethinking notions of exchange. You know, how does value accrue, according to mm -hmm. a sort of old Marxist idea, it accrues through exchange. And I suppose that's important political work um, of a rigor to draw on to rethink the dynamics of exchange. In order to do that, we really need to think about sexuate difference. We need to think beyond the masculine-feminine binary and, and, and really take hold of um, a, a different kind of difference. And I think there's lots of feminist work that's around to do that, but to think that through in a kind of lived, embodied, everyday way, which I think a rigor also helps us to do, actually, is, is the big challenge. So I don't know if we want to go down um, mm. a road of thinking again about capital, um, but we might want to think differently about value. And I think that's a feminist project. How that accrues for the maternal is a <laughs> big and difficult issue, and I, I was concerned in my book to try to write an ethics of... Um, the maternal through what I've called a partial phenomenology of motherhood because I think there are two things that need to be done. One is to articulate what an ethical position might be in relation to another who is a child, that is a ruthless, um, dependent other. Um, what might the ethics of that encounter be that doesn't return women to a discourse of the angel in the house of basically giving your life up for the sake of another, mm -hmm. even if it's for a short period of time? So trying to get away from a kind of masochistic account. And in order to do that, we actually have to account for the mother's otherness. We need an account of maternal alterity in order that that exchange can be a dynamic and generative exchange. And that's a bit of technical, if you like, sort of philosophical work that I try to do in the book and, of course, inevitably fails because all of these projects must and, and do fail and part of our writing of them is to embrace that. But some at least reckoning with the idea of what comes back to the mother from the child that allows the mother to experience her own otherness has to be in there, otherwise she's just going to disappear again. Mm. So that's one bit of it. And then the other bit is, is, you know, the partial phenomenology is about saying, how do we excavate um, lived experience in a way that doesn't just return us to the kind of stereotypes that you were talking about at, mm. at the beginning, although all experience is mediated. It's mediated, I think, through a sort of subjective experience that fractures those mediated forms constantly over and over again. So I try to home in on fragments of maternal experience that I thought sort of tripped us up mm -hmm. and revealed, if you like, the, 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 the moment that um, the otherness of the child comes to us and generates a new subjective position. And so they're very odd. I, I try to notice odd things about motherhood. When we name our child, for example, many of us for the first few weeks mm -hmm. of speaking with our child's name, feel very uncomfortable about this name. There's a kind of odd gap between the child and its name. And I tried to do some work also on my own children calling me Lisa instead of mum, <laughs> insisting on renaming me with my own name and what that sort of did for me as a subject, a maternal subject. I tried to think about the mother in the city with all her stuff, with bags and bottles and, you know, negotiating the urban landscape, to think of her as viscous, as weighed down, as impeded, as slowed up. So not this fluid subjectivity, mm. the opposite, the way that motherhood really impedes and stops us, in a way, in our tracks. And then what, what is generative about that? What new can come out of that? I try to think about moments when the mother went and lost the transitional object, you know, the object the child so needs to work out its experience between me and not me, the child really needs this, you know, and what happens, the mother goes and loses the bloody transitional object. Where, where does that place her, you know, in relation to that child? What was that Makes object her for her? more important temporarily. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the wish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the unconscious wish. <laughs> sure. So I guess I was looking for these moments that motherhood tripped us up to allow us to open up that phenomenological experience of motherhood in relation to that renewed idea of the mother's otherness that's brought to her through the encounter with the child. And, and that's my response, I suppose, mm. to you about value.
actually yeah. we have to start with those those tiny we have to do that feminist work really of returning to the, to the personal but not in a monolithic the personal way but actually trying to open up the personal to understanding how um it fractures subjectivity something mm. like that do you think one of the things that makes that work so difficult to do is that if everybody's had to untangle themselves from their mother and their mothers had to be dropped then then having dropped that that figure then how do you start to say actually it's really important it's great it's you know give it a value again well i think we have mm. to challenge psychoanalytically whether we do have to drop our mothers yeah. whether, whether we do have to um, come into subjectivity through, only through processes of separation mm. frustration and loss mm. and i think much feminist work i'm thinking about um Bracha ettinger's work mm. um uh, griselda pollock's take on that for example has really been about trying to say well maybe there are multiple Sub, sub, sort of substratus of psychic life of course we have to develop at some level through separation and castration and loss particularly of the maternal body but we also retain something we mm. also have to develop in co-emergence with another mm. that doesn't have to be lost and in fact mustn't be lost must be retained mm. and you know attinger calls that the matrixial that that's that is a, a if you like deeply connected with Mm. the maternal. Mm -hmm. So I think we also have to keep challenging those aspects of psychoanalytic theory that we take as a given and and sort of mourn, if you like, I and know. say, oh, well, well, we, well, you know, this is just how it is, and say, well, is it how it is? I know, but isn't the thing, I don't know, this is being too cheeky, but that you can think all those things and then your mother invites you for Sunday dinner <laughs> in a demanding way. <laughs> you know, it always gets called into question or something. Oh, yeah, I mean, we all have to deal with yeah. our mothers, you know. I'm not, I'm not in any way denying that. Mm. But whether we have to understand the child's journey as a journey of um, dumping the mother mm. and then as a mother having to, to reconnect with this dumped thing, mm -hmm. I think that's the legacy of a certain strain of thinking mm. that I think feminism is in constant dialogue with and we should keep being in dialogue mm. with. And I don't think we necessarily have to, to play that out. And is it necessarily our kind of literal mothers? Um, and could um, mothers occupy this space of otherness that opens up by this kind of big shock of being um, a mother um, through the kind of through being able to speak it and have it seen? I'm thinking of um, practices like Enemies of Good Art, bringing with it women together, and um, Mamsi, your interdisciplinary research network, and the subjectivities and feminisms network and then you should go back you know through your your writing and and uh, i'm sure you know through what you hear with your your kind of patients but um that can this kind of space in between be renewed and held and exist with other women can we kind of exist in motherness to be able to be mothers i think from my from my own point of view when i found enemies of lost art, I had this idea that actually motherhood was this amazing and powerful and liberating experience that had happened to me, but that it was also something to be kind of um, hidden or um, not ashamed of, but that to kind of rant on about how kind of joyful it was and how ecstatically kind of in love I felt and everything made me sound like I was a bit bonkers and probably not very professional anymore. And so the kind of sense of isolation and loneliness with that really felt quite articulated by being able to be in enemies of good art. And I'm sure if for um, perhaps in the feminism and the subjectivities group and the and Mamsi, that might might be. I'm speaking from a, an anecdotal kind of personal um, position. I think there's enormous value in continually. Um, raising the visibility of maternal experience and I think there are now lots of forums in which that's happening and I think Mumsnet is a really interesting phenomena that needs mm. to be excavated and thought about but I think Mo put her finger on it in saying actually the real work is about theorising the maternal and it's that that is a political project and it's that that is empowering mm. it's not simply the sharing of experiences although that is of course important it's the it's the ongoing process of rethinking the genealogies that we inherit the, the histories of knowledge that we're around certain kinds of experiences that we ha inherit that need to be rethought in each generation that work mm. is, is I think the work certainly of Mamsi and I think to some degree also of Enemies of Good Art and, and some of these newer networks that are emerging How might it be for um, young women in art schools and being mothers now do you think 
do you think they can be taken seriously as feminists and um, make work about their experiences or be positively identified as artists? It's quite hard to be a female artist anyway, we kind of know historically. Yes, absolutely, and I, as I agree totally with Lisa there about um, the possibility how to how to articulate, how to how to come to terms with, how to be productive through um, this personal experience. Certainly, motherhood is often is really at, with undergraduate students quite unusual experience, um, um, and so in in way that's one step further i think in a way of, of, of a problematic but i think there is i mean the necessity of sharing uh, our experience and being able to start to articulate and produce um our, our own language to produce to to up to be to become articulate in whatever form suits us um i'm talking about being in an art school of course producing artworks um, but I think the the, the sharing and the realization of of uh, and, and theorizing I ha I have to call it theorizing following Lisa there as well that um, a certain understanding of this history that it's not just a personal thing that we keep hidden uh, that it has no truck out there in the world um, I think that continues continues to be um, a thing that we need to share and certainly collaboration um, and, and I'm speaking of my experience here of, as a researcher, as an artist uh, and we mentioned this at Chelsea the, uh, the, the research group which we formed quite a few years ago now of Subjectivity and Feminism's research group which actually includes goes right the way down from um, uh, art, uh, the artists, the teachers, the researchers, uh, professors at the university, uh, down to uh, Chelsea Art School, down to um, through PhD students, MA students and BA students take part in collective, collaborative um, events that we put on and how that actually is s almost starting there with that kind of language, that um, that production. Um, starts to make sense, I think, for ourselves continually. It needs, as, you, as Lisa said, it const needs constantly rewriting, uh, rethinking through. It's always in process. It's we never get there. We um, and certainly um, this uh, rigor and as Lisa mentioned as well, her, her 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 thing on ethics and this dynamics of exchange. Uh, absolutely being this relation between how this might be spoken this generous act this this um this articulating something between and together is a very important way of um of reflecting on our own individual uh, experience but actually giving it truck out there in the world Thank you. <laughs> yes, that, that sounds great. Um, and um, I'm sorry to kind of bring it to a, a more kind of banal <laughs> place again, but I'm just thinking about what I kind of like set out in, in, in the um, synopsis about um, why not having it all might not be a bad thing. And I just wondered if we could talk briefly about that before we kind of come to an end that is quite... Um, intimidating perhaps the project of you know, motherhood and kind of feminism and to be able to manage um, being in love and having a marriage and maintaining kind of economic stability and being a, a functioning mother in the world um, are all quite kind of um, hard jobs and it's certainly kind of you know perhaps not a failure to not be able to have it all and something more interesting might be able to come come out of that are there any thoughts on on that I know it's Slightly different, moving into slightly different area. Certainly, I don't know. I mean, the idea of having it all is impossible, and I suppose if you arrived there, then you, it would be a morbid state, and you'd seem to become <laughs> very unhappy. But also, you'd, you'd be the object object of such enormous envy from other people that it would be a, a sort of horrifying position to occupy. So it's it's certainly not 
something to wish for. But the thing of having less than everything or of there being a hole that you have to fill or a gap that you have to fix or something to be mended, it sounds something like the thing that Mo is talking about, this kind of productive futility or there's there's something impossible that you're trying to work with and you're never going to fix it but that's an incredibly productive position to be in or something so you keep trying you don't say oh goodness that's rubbish we'll stop mm. I suppose I think your your question returns us in a way to um, some of the work on social class that you were talking about at the very beginning you cited Imogen Tyler up in mm. Lancaster and her work on on Pramface and, and, and the sort of Chav culture and, and also Tracy Jensen's work and I think it's really important to deconstruct some of that kind of trajectory where what you've just described of the habit all mother is a middle class mm. um, sort of story about a mother who or a woman who moves from sort of higher education into the workplace and then into a relationship and 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 marriage supposedly and then it's a heteronormative story it's a very particular kind of story that is incredibly dominant at the moment and I think you know that men Really, all of us feel we fail that story in mm. a way, but also there are multiple stories out there of motherhood. We've seen two demographics emerging: one of, of women obviously having children much later after a career, but also, you know, a, a big growth in women having children much earlier. You know, in their late teens and early twenties, and these are very, very different stories, if you like, of of having at all or not having at all. And so, it's, in a way, we've come full circle back to really thinking about the. Um, complex interrelation between feminisms, social class, mm. race, and, and the other structuring sort of factors in all of our lives. Mm. Yes, and sometimes by the time we arrive at the institution, in terms of its being able to in endorse um, and institutionalize feminism and being able to take subjectivity and the maternal seriously, we are in a place at least of some. Of um, consciousness raising, if you can use that kind of old term, or um, of being able to articulate. And I think the the power of the popular image of the mother is still incredibly important, and it can be um, surrounded by a lot of um, kind of envy and competition. I think it's quite important what you said, Anishka, there about if you have it or you've the subject of kind of great envy, and certainly the. You know, the playground is a very kind of competitive place and being able to think outside of that and kind of cut out of that is quite important. And I was just thinking, Lisa, what you were talking about, about is there a possibility of thinking about the ordinariness of um, motherhood, about how ordinariness might be understood and depicted in all our kind of usual kind of, um, you know, different ways of, of being mothers. And I thought of um, a very kind of popular um, one because I thought the place of ordinariness might be occupied by reality TV and that this was um, you know, a difficult place because of the it's being loaded with kind of you know, class and kind of the ambivalence about, about class. And I was thinking about soap operas and how um, we see ordinary depictions of mothers there. And I was thinking in particular of um, EastEnders, where we have the story of um, Kat and Ronnie both having had um, babies at the same time, and Ronnie, in her grief at losing her child to cot death, swaps her baby with Kat's baby. And then this very complicated kind of scenario goes on of um, that Ronnie being not able to grieve for her lost baby and of um, Kat occupying this place of of loss, this very public place of the mother, who's a mother but she doesn't have a, a baby with her and people don't come into her pub anymore or they can't talk to her about it um, and it's a it provokes very powerful um, feelings but also very powerful public imaginary so to the point where the actress playing Ronnie is um, kind of publicly vilified, you know, people shout at her and she throws things at her in supermarkets and the tabloid press is full of the kind of disgust at um, this story and the BBC has been told to dismantle it, take it down and kind of change it, return the mother to its, the baby to its rightful mother. And um, I think both Anika uh, and Lucy have some quite interesting things to say about that when we mentioned it before about attachment to a, to a baby and about, about how, how um, love operates. Yeah, I mean, I think it's always extraordinary to watch the um, vitriol 
and aggression that's released by these stories. And I guess it, the counterpart would be, if you like, the real-life story of Baby P that sits alongside mm -hmm. this fictionalised story in which, as you say, the fiction and then the reality of the actress being spat out in the street becomes very, very confused. I suppose what that brought to mind for me was what's being occluded you know what does that kind of very over the top reaction stop us from thinking about and i i think one of the really difficult things around thinking about mothers is in, in the old days we used to think about it in terms of kind of the, the all powerful mother and that mothers have enormous power over over infants and that's what we need to defend against but actually i'm quite interested in the idea that what's really difficult to think about is the enormous struggle that mothers have to make attachments to children that to become a mother means to choose a child out of all the other children as your child, whether you're a birth mother or, or, or one of the many other mothers who who um, care for children. That act is actually a very is a struggle. It's an ambivalent act, and I think that's a particular story about the swapping of children and what it means for a, one mother to choose somebody else's child as her child, and. I, I think it, it reveals some aspect of, of the maternal that is really troubling around how precarious in the end it is, the, the attachments between parents and children. And we usually think about that from the infant's point of view, that the struggle that the infant has is in a way to, to manage their feelings in relation to objects and, and the, whole, the whole kind of process of becoming attached, if you like, to objects and then being able to work that through. But I think that's also a maternal issue that we don't want to think about. Yes, um, mothers gone wrong and mothers not kind of able to mother are are kind of almost to be subject, aren't they? And yet it does it does happen, you know. That I mean, in in various um, ways. Anishka, you were saying that um, your patients talked about EastEnders. Yeah, so I, I've only watched it <laughs> that story. vicariously, but yeah. I heard a lot about it. But I know this thing that that in terms of love that. Um, Biochemically, you know, maternal love and erotic love or romantic love aren't dissimilar. I mean, the same chemical reactions take place in the brain. But for human beings, it's incredibly important to make a difference between the two forms of love. And it looks like one of the things that's, that's different is that with erotic or romantic love, the object's um, replaceable, you know, even if you're madly in love, you know, whatever, if your husband's suddenly not there, you're partner suddenly not there then you might be able to get a new one but um with with a baby it's sort of non-transferable babies supposedly aren't replaceable except in eastenders so it's <laughs> broken a really sort of um, a, a difficult thing because that's one of the things that guarantees that that erotic love and maternal love aren't the same whereas well maybe they're not actually that different and so eastenders seems to put that somehow in question even at an unconscious level well wow. <laughs> um, I, I sense a, a kind of larger subject <laughs> emerging now about, um, <laughs> about love but um, um, I'm just wondering if there are any kind of final, final things that we can say from our different positions before we come to the end of, of this talk about motherhood, power and love well you know, I I do think there's <clears throat> they're loaded with danger. <laughs> the, <laughs> this mothers. is territory. <laughs> this is territory that's very, I think, dangerous on a psychic level, on a on a political level, I, but mostly on a, on this personal level of something that's almost um, regressive. That we, I mean, essentialism is being mentioned already that the uh, you know that as a as this insistence on a certain kind of experience um, as a subject position um, which can be you, uh, you know it's scary uh, I, I want to this is not all gushy lovely mm. um, it's a, it, it's a difficult territory on a personal level uh, cultural level, ethical level, as Lisa says as well, but there is an inc but nevertheless, on that's why maybe because it's such dangerous territory, personally, psychically, for your own stability, mental health, and so on. I read an article the other day by a woman who had has uh, suffered depression and was very anxious about becoming mm -hmm. a mother. I don't know if any of you read that. And that she, to her delight, found it actually liberating and brought her incredible happiness. But this could be looked at by, you know, 
doctors or whatever psychoanalysts as a, a or maybe it's just chemical in that particular <laughs> woman but in another way it's it's a, it's a, an area that is difficult uh, as i keep repeating myself on a personal level as well you know this so it's okay for it to be scary it's okay for it to be mm. difficult and we need to kind of live with that um anishka is there anything oh my like god no i can't believe you'd oh. ask me to say something okay. conclusive on the subject of mothers what a right. terrifying thought <laughs> <laughs> lisa <laughs> I suppose maybe we just need to return to the title of, of the talk, which was mm. about motherhood, power and love. And I suppose mm. in, in some ways, perhaps we have struggled to think through the, the implications of power, mm. I guess. We've touched on it in terms of social class and uh, uh, sort of social and, and cultural ways of thinking about power. But um, maybe that's the most terrifying bit in the end, after all, is, is something about the the, the levels of dependency that are brought up in in relation to um, mothering that are are very very difficult to manage. And perhaps that's why it's important to um, think about it theoretically to be able to have that occupy the space in our language and within the institution, as most talks so powerfully about. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks you very, very much. much.